two for April 5th. This is going to be um, the rest of the Unit 12 stuff before we get, have to cover it tomorrow in class. The rest of Gerald Ford and some of Carter today, too. All right, so we just finished up the Southeast Asia issues and how this was a low point in our, you know, psyche in terms of all that happened with Vietnam. But we're moving on down to the economy and domestic policies. So, Nick, so just like Nixon, Ford has to figure out ways to deal with this economy and has to figure out, figure out a way to beat inflation. He tried to beat inflation with a program called Whip Inflation Now, which was voluntary. So when was the campaign that he creates, Whip Inflation Now? But the problem with, with when was that it was completely voluntary. So he encouraged people to try to save more and you know buy these kind of products more or buy less here and there. But it was all voluntary, and so it didn't have the effects that he hoped it would have. And so since there was no incentives, it, we only sank deeper into an economic recession, and unemployment stayed around 9% throughout the 70s as a result. Um, he did agree to a democratic stimulus package to help the economy, um, but he did veto 39 other democratic bills because Democrats still control Congress. And the stimulus package was okay, but the fact is it still puts us deeper in debt because you're not raising taxes to help pay for all these things either. One high point of his administration was the bicentennial celebration that in 1976 we kind of helped – it helps us forget Watergate and Vietnam a little bit by helping us celebrate our history and, uh, and what was good about America and so on. So there is some positive here when how we celebrate ourselves and – Help and Ford, and in the way he treats him, he treats the presidency, does help restore some of the candor and humility to the White House. So Ford, there's not much to say about Ford. There's no major policies that happen here under him, um, but he does help to facilitate these, uh, you know, the the in the end of the Watergate stuff. The economy still struggles, but we're not really going to see any major changes until the 1980s here. There's something I don't have written down that you might want to have down. One thing for the Cold War that Ford does is called the Helsinki Accords before I go into the election. So this is not really tied to any of this, but one of the things that Ford does related to the Cold War is that he passes what's called the Helsinki Accords with the Soviets, which basically was another arms reduction treaty. So in the mid-70s, then I don't think you'll see a question on this. It's not on my test, but you might see it show up on the AP test. If you see anything on the Helsinki Accords, it was like the one bright spot in Ford's administration where – he does they, he does they taunt he does he continues salt but the Helsinki Accords is another type of arms reduction treaty with the Soviets in 19 in the mid 70s. So the election in 76. Uh, Watergate still hurt the Republicans in the 1976 election. Ford was challenged um, by other Republicans because he wasn't really the official nominee for Republicans because he'd only replaced Nixon. Ronald Reagan, who had gotten a lot of support from conservatives, challenged Ford and almost beat him. So Ford almost didn't win his own nomination in 76 because Ronald Reagan was this rising conservative star in the mid-70s. But Ford does go on to run for uh, Republicans, um, but he can't beat Jimmy Carter. People have been kind of tired of White House and uh, – not White House – Washington elite and the people in the White Washington that feel like were hurting the, um, the economy and the government. So they wanted an outsider. So they picked Governor Jimmy Carter from Georgia instead of – Ford. So he was picked as the Washington outsider to help come in and change things around in Washington. Um, he won most of the South. He also won 97% of the African American vote. Democrats also controlled Congress, so they were able to get some things accomplished in the Carter. But you're going to see he's also fairly ineffective as president. So now we're looking here at Jimmy Carter as president. Um, Jimmy Carter's informal style seemed to signal the end of the imperial presidency. But he had difficulty with veteran members of Congress since he was an outsider and his advisors didn't help. So because he was an outsider, he didn't always understand how Congress works. Even though he had a Democratic Congress, they didn't do, do the things that Jimmy Carter wanted them to do or wanted him to do for, the, for him. And so it just made things – so even if you have, you have both these guys Democrats, it didn't always work out in their favor in terms of getting things accomplished as a result. So look at his foreign policy. One of the big things that he promoted while he was president and even, even after he was president is human rights. Um, he preached like Wilson to the world about this issue of human rights, how countries should be respectful to human rights and how they should help protect humanity and help protect those who can't help themselves. Um, 
He appointed Andrew Young as the first African American ambassador to the United Nations. He also denounced the oppression of the black majority in South Africa in the apartheid um, prosecutions in that time period. He also opposed the oppression of blacks in Zimbabwe in the same time. Carter also cut off aid to countries like Argentina and Chile because of their oppressive dictators. So he really did try to only deal with countries that weren't so uh, dictatorial and respected human rights, although it won't always work out for him. Um, he does try to, even after he's president, that's one of the things he continues to work for is human rights. In fact, he won a, new, a Nobel Peace Prize uh, later on because of his efforts in the human rights arena. For the Panama Canal, he does turn the Panama Canal over to, uh, back over to Panama. In 1978, the Senate agreed to a treaty that would give Panama control of the canal zone by 2000. So January 1st, 2000 is the date that Panama regained the canal, but that was because of Jimmy Carter. Um, this actually will be used against him in the re-election campaign in 1980 because people felt like that, you know, that would hurt our economy and hurt us. Obviously, Theodore Roosevelt would be rolling the ground as well, too. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's an issue in and of itself. Um, all right, next is the Camp David Accords. Probably the, the, biggest thing, the biggest thing that Jimmy Carter accomplished was the Camp David Accords. In 1977, Egypt, the Egyptian president, and you don't have to write this guy's name down, Anwar Sadat. Anwar Sadat, this man right here, decided to reach out to Israel in 1977. At this point, Egypt, being a Muslim country, had been at, at odds and at war with Israel since you know the past several decades. And they had fought each other most recently in the early 70s war that we just talked about on the other video. Um, so anyway, the, this president decides, let's reach out and make a deal. Because they had actually lost, lost territory to Israel in this war as well, too. Uh, he decided, the, the, the Israeli minister, the prime minister of Israel is uh, Minichem uh, Begin, or Begin, however you say it. Um, and so they, they try to work out some kind of deal. Carr decides to be this neutral third party. He invites these two guys to come out to Camp David. Camp David is the uh, private presidential retreat center in Maryland. So he brings out Anwar Sadat and Begin from Israel to meet in Camp David in 78. And they're going to work on uh, a resolution to their conflict. It almost didn't happen, but Carr is able to convince them to work out some kind of deal. And so the Camp David Accords are signed off, and you can see them here signing off on it. They're going to sign off on this in 1978, and it's going to be um, a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. So it's a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. But it's also significant because it's the first time a Muslim country in the Middle East recognizes the existence of Israel. That's why the Camp David Accords are so significant, because it's the first time a Muslim country recognizes the existence of Israel as a country. So... This is important because it's it's one of the first steps towards peace in the Middle East. You know, obviously there's still issues today, but this is an important step forward in making things better in the Middle East in general. Um, the next event is the Iranian hostage crisis. So this is the, actually the worst event that take place under Jimmy Carter. You might remember a long time ago we helped out. Um, we helped out these guys, this guy in Israel, get get back into power. The Ayat, um, the Shah of Iran, um, Reza, Reza Pahlavi. We talked about this in Unit 11. The CIA overthrew the government in Iran and put this guy in charge. Well, this guy had been running the government, this the Shah, for 20 years, but he was very oppressive to his people. He was very much for Western help and Western influence, and he embraced Western culture. Americans had a great relationship with the Reza Pahlavi, the Shah, but. Um, his people were not, and his people were getting increasingly upset with the Shah by the 70s. And so what begins to happen in the 1970s is this big Islamic revolution trying to push out Western influence. And it's not just Iran, but several countries in the Middle East begin to have this fundamentalist Muslim movement trying to get rid of any kind of Western influence, including America. And so it became apparent by 78, 79 that, that, that Reza Pahlavi, the Shah, would not be able to maintain control of his own country. So he flees. And the guy who comes in and replaces him is this religious leader named Ayatollah Khomeini. This is him right here. Ayatollah is his title. Khomeini is, is his name. The Ayatollah uh, takes over and makes Iran a much stricter 
uh, Muslim fundamentalist country as a result, and now it becomes an enemy of, of the United States. So in the meantime, um, you see Pahlavi is traveling around the world trying to find a place to stay now because he's, um, he's in exile. Well, at one point he gets cancer. And so against the advice of various advisors, Jimmy Carter invites uh, the Shah of Iran to come to America to get cancer treatment. So once Iran finds out that we're harboring the Shah, they demand his release. And when we refuse to give him up, some college students in Iran overrun the U.S. Embassy inside of, uh, of Tehran and take it over, capturing about 60 Americans and holding them hostage. So in, in starting November of 1979, you're going to have about 60 Americans held hostage for over 440 days by the Iranians in Iran. Um, this also leads to a second oil crisis in 79 because all those guys who are revolting in Iran aren't working in the factories. Thus, um, you have a 1979 OPEC oil crisis again, which only hurts us back home in the United States as well. So oil production stopped for a second time and created a second worldwide oil crisis with this revolution taking place in 79 too. So Carter tried to negotiate with these guys for five months. He negotiates, negotiates for five months, try to, tries to get them to release our hostages. They won't budge until we release um, the Shah. So he tries to send, after five months of negotiation, he tries to send in our U.S. military special forces. On When the mission was going, uh, there were some mechanical failures. Like one of the, the planes crashed. It was a big like disaster. So they never even got there. So the the attempt at an, an, an uh, invasion to go get these guys out or this hostage release failed so it just made Carter look more inept as a result and so he continued throughout the rest of his, his last year of his presidency to try to get these guys released um, but then the Shaw finally dies the Shaw dies in early 19 or excuse me late 1980 around December and so it, they begin to negotiate the release of the hostages but out of spite against Carter they won't they won't be released um, until Ronald Reagan is inaugurated. So on the day that Ronald Reagan gets inaugurated in January of 1981, after they find out he's officially the president and Jimmy Carter is not the president, they're going to release um, the hostages. Just kind of the last slap in the face to Carter. Okay, so I think that's where we're going to stop. Uh, we can pretty much get the rest tomorrow. So we'll stop there. Uh, we'll cover the rest of the Cold War stuff and domestic policies and all that with, with Carter uh, on Thursday to wrap up Unit 12. We'll finish up Unit 12 tomorrow. Be ready for the test on Friday. Uh, as a special incentive for people who are watching these videos, if you watch all the way through to this this point, um, make a comment under the YouTube video. Don't tell everybody, tell everybody about this. Make a brief little comment under this, under this YouTube video, only video two, and I'll give you some bonus, like five or ten points or something like that. And it'll be added in sometime later this week or sometime soon, okay? So make a little comment under this video to show, tell me that you watched it. Don't tell your friends because if I have 38 people who signed in and, and said for bonus, that tells me that not everybody watched the videos. But if you make a little comment on here um, and say that, hey, I watched it at the end, I'll, you can get some bonus, okay?